Hello Church, it's good to be with you all today. My name's Lauren and today we're going to be looking at Exodus chapters 32 and 33. I'd really encourage you to read these through in full before we start, um, but I can give you a really quick whistle-stop tour. Uh, basically what happens in these verses is Moses goes up on top of a mountain to go and meet with God and God is giving him plans for the tabernacle of God. And while Moses is up there, the rest of the people of Israel and his brother Aaron are down at the bottom of the mountain, getting a little bit bored. And as they're getting bored and getting distracted, they want to make an idol to another God because they're thinking, well, God's just left us here. What are we supposed to do? And they make an idol. God gets really mad at them. He wants to punish them. He actually wants to wipe them out. Moses says, don't do it. He, he intercedes on their behalf. God decides not to do it and the people are saved. Most of the people are saved, the ones who um, don't have pride in their hearts and the ones who say yes to turning back to God. So that is a super quick tour of those chapters. But what I want to talk about to start with is about covenant. Now, to know about covenant, we're going to have to go all the way back to Genesis 15. And in Genesis 15, this is when God makes a covenant with Abraham. And he says to Abraham, if you and your family will worship me and no one but me, then I will bless you, I will bless your family, and I will make you have descendants, loads and loads of descendants. <laughs> and they make the covenant. And in order to make the covenant official, God asks Abraham to do something. He says, I want you to sacrifice and get together, um, I think it's a bull, um, a ram, and a few birds. And he says, um, I want you to get them ready for the ceremony. And so what Abraham does is he cuts them all in half. Sounds a bit disgusting. He cuts them all up and he spreads them out along the ground. And this was called the cutting of the covenant. Now, you would cut these animals in half and you would lay them in parallel lines. And both of the parties that were making the covenant would walk through this uh, walkway together. And this was basically a sign and a word to each other that says, may I be like this, cut in half, destroyed, um, receive bloodshed if I break my promise to you. And so that is how they used to solidify covenants back in those days. I'm glad that we do it with a signature now. It feels much easier. Um, but this is how it would happen. So God asked Abraham, Abraham, I want you to get um, the walkway ready. So Abraham does that. He cuts up the animals. He prepares the walkway. And once it's done, it says that God sent Abraham into a deep sleep. And while he was in that sleep, he had a vision. In the vision, he saw God walking through the walkway that Abraham had made. But the thing was, God was walking through alone. No one else, just him. This was God's way of saying that even if Abraham and his children and his many descendants that God had promised to him didn't keep their end of the bargain, God would still keep his covenant and be faithful to his people, Abraham and the nation of Israel. And he said this no matter what the cost. He walked through that making the promise that be it unto me that if I don't keep my promise that I would be torn apart like these animals were, that there would be bloodshed, that I would shed blood if this covenant is not kept. Yet he expected nothing of Abraham. He said, no matter what you do, whether you do it or not, I promise to keep my covenant. And we know that this was fulfilled in Jesus, who literally was torn in two, who uh, shed blood for us so that God could keep his covenant with us. And the rest of the Bible is basically just stories of Israel, the people of God, trying to keep the covenant and then failing. And then God saying, it's okay, I love you. And then they try again, and I bet you guessed it, they fail again. And this goes on and on and on and on until Jesus walks onto the scene. 
But this is some of the history behind where we are now in Exodus 32. We find ourselves, Abraham and God have made this covenant. And now we find ourselves with Moses. Moses is at the top of the mountain and God is giving him plans for the tabernacle of how to build it, of what it's going to look like, while everyone else is at the foot of the mountain. And I don't know about you, but there are times where we're waiting on God. The Israelites, they're there, they're waiting to hear from God because God's giving all the plans to Moses. And so they're waiting on the word of God. But while they're waiting, they get bored, they get impatient, they get distracted. And the people look to Aaron to build for them a golden calf. They say, we want to have a God to worship. We don't know where this other God is, this God with Moses, where is he? We haven't heard from him. We need to worship something. And so Moses collects from the camp all of the gold that he can. He melts it down and he builds a golden calf for them to worship. He builds for them an idol. They make the idol and they worship another God. They fall into a host of sin. Here we see Israel failing again, making other idols, not keeping their covenant to God, even though God himself has been faithful time and time again. I don't know how you feel about waiting. It can be really hard to wait sometimes. What do you do while you're waiting? You might think of yourself at a doctor's office or in a waiting room somewhere. Usually you just grab a boring magazine and you just find yourself reading anything and whatever is there because you just want to keep your mind occupied. You, want, you don't want to get bored. People, we don't want to get bored. Our, we are used to getting things at our attention. We've got our phones, whatever it might be. But when we look at biblical waiting, in the Bible, the word wait actually means, it basically means to set up an ambush. It means to prepare yourself so that when the thing that you're waiting for comes, you are ready in an instant to grab hold of it and to take it. Waiting in the Bible is not passive. You may think of waiting as sitting back, relaxing, um, sitting on your sofa, watching something on the TV. I'm just waiting until something better comes along or I'm waiting until my event starts or whatever it might be. But it's very passive. But in the Bible, waiting is active. We see here the Israelites are being horrendously passive in their waiting in that they don't know what to do with themselves. They're getting bored. They're getting distracted. Do you end up finding idols for yourself in your impatience on waiting to hear from God? There are times where we have unanswered prayer and we don't know what to do with ourselves while we're waiting to hear the voice of God, the instruction of God, to know, God, what do you want me to do? What are you saying in this situation? And I know that for myself, I have definitely made idols of other things because I've um, because I've become bored or I've become disillusioned. I have fallen away because I've not got an answer in the time frame that I expected or put on God for myself. I gave it to him and said, I'm going to need to know in a week, so get back to me. And then when that hasn't happened two months later, I've, you know, my mind's gone elsewhere. It can become so easy to make idols of other things. And an idol is simply anything that sets itself up to become more important to you than God. So it doesn't matter if you love Jesus and you're a Christian, you can still end up worshipping another idol because you give it your affection, you give it your attention over and above God. Let me give you some examples. Some of the ways that you might find out, do I have any idols in my life? First of all, have a look at your diary. What are your priorities? What are you spending your time on? Are you spending your time on God? Are you just trying to fill time? Are you distracting yourself from what's going on in your world? Are you trying to avoid something? Are you trying to avoid life? Or are you just keeping busy with things other than God? Because you can. 
You might want to look at your bank account and your financial records and see where you're spending your money. That's going to be another great sign of seeing where your priorities are. What do I choose to spend my money on? Do I choose to give it to the godly pursuits, the things of God? Do I choose to give into um, what God is saying? Or do I spend money on myself, on appeasing myself, on keeping myself happy, helping me just get through and get by rather than flourishing with God? So when we grow tired of waiting on unanswered prayer, just like Israel, we can feel alone. We can feel disillusioned. And we become tempted to engage in something soothing. That might be Netflix. It could be food, gluttony. It could be alcohol or sex. It could be family or ministry. Just because it's a good thing doesn't mean that it should be worshipped over and above God. Even our ministry unto God um, needs to be below our love of God. If we start loving ministry or even the things God has given to us, like family, more than God himself, we've made an idol of that thing. So God-given things can become idols when we put them above God and find ourselves worshipping them rather than God. And so be careful because you are going to be surrounded by temptation at all moments. I am surrounded by temptation at all moments and the enemy is just waiting for us to become impatient enough to find satisfaction in something other than God. He is waiting for us to become distracted, bored, impatient, that we would say, let me just go and spend some more time over there. Let me just do something else that's going to distract me while I wait, rather than doing what the Bible says about waiting and getting ready. How can you prepare yourself for what's next, rather than just being passive and allowing other things to become more important to you? Because what we're watching, what we're doing, what we're focusing on, those things can change throughout your life how much energy and effort you give to things will change throughout your life. But God always needs to remain as number one. So these idols that we can put up in replacement of God, they're real. And when we engage with them and allow them to become idols, because they're not bad in and of themselves. Netflix is not bad in and of itself. I love Netflix. I watch it all the time. It's not a bad thing. But when I put it above God and I put it as the thing that can soothe me or the thing that makes me feel better over and, over and above God, I make an idol of it. Which means I run to Netflix when I'm not okay rather than running to God. We could even end up running to our spouse rather than running to God. You should probably run to both, but definitely be running to God. Anything that is above God can become that idol in our life. And the spirit realm is real. It is real. And when we open ourselves up to other gods, whatever they may be, and you might want to call them idols, you might want to call them gods, evil spirits, demons, like I don't know where you're at, but there's a lot of different names for them in the Bible. But they are real. And when we open ourselves up to them, what we're actually doing is giving ourselves over to them to have the controlling influence over our bodies, our minds, our emotions and our spirit. So let me ask you, where do you run to for comfort? Where do you run to when you are bored or impatient, feeling alone or simply waiting? Where do you go to and where do you run to? Where is your source of comfort? And as I'm speaking now, I'm hoping that Holy Spirit is prompting you, that he is prodding you and bringing to mind any areas of your life in which you may have created or allowed something to be an idol in your life. So we're simply going to pray right now because it's, it's really easy. There's no condemnation, there is no shame. 
So we're just going to pray. So you might want to repeat after me. If there's something that Holy Spirit's revealed to you, then you can just say, Holy Spirit, thank you for bringing this to my attention. I repent of making this an idol. I choose to lay it down and bring my affection and my attention back to you. Help me, God, to be disciplined so that I don't make this thing an idol again. Amen. Super easy, right? So this is the first part of the story. But what happens next? We see Moses goes down to the the bottom of the mountain and he sees that everyone is messing up, that they are making an idol. And as Moses talks to God, God is processing with him. God's angry. He is not happy. He can see that um, his people, Israel, have so quickly gone against him after everything that he did for them so far, that they've already forgotten who he is, that they've already forgotten what he did, and that they already want to go and make another god because they don't have anyone to worship, so they say. And he's processing with Moses. He's angry. He even says, I want to just get rid of all of them. And I know that sounds, I find this really hard to hear from God. I'm thinking, this isn't the Jesus that I know that wants to kill everyone. But God's unhappy because he knows that he's the only one who deserves the worship. He's unhappy and he's processing. And he's telling Moses, the people are corrupt. They're proud people. They have turned from me. And what happens is that Moses intercedes on behalf of the people of Israel. He knows they've screwed up. He knows that they've done wrong. He's not trying to justify and say, God, they're not doing anything wrong. Just forget about it. He recognizes they've done something wrong. But he intercedes for them. And intercession is simply standing in the gap for someone else and representing someone else. And so Moses says to God, well, even if there's some righteous, wouldn't you save them? And he he talks to God, he talks to God, he intercedes and he's basically, he's standing in the gap for them and saying, God, have mercy on them. They are your people. And he even says, like, what would, what would the surrounding nations think if you just destroyed everyone? When you've just appeared so great to everyone else, why would you do that? And he intercedes on, the, on behalf of the people, and it says that God relents. And it says that he changes his mind. And this word relent in Hebrew is actually the word naham, and it uh, can be translated as change change your mind. It could be translated as repent. Um, This doesn't mean that God has actually done anything wrong. It doesn't mean that he's sinning because God can't sin. He is perfection. It doesn't mean that he needs to repent because he's done something wrong. But this word Nahum actually carries the idea of regret. It carries the idea of remorse over a decision. So it's not that God was wrong, but that he's moved emotionally by Moses' intercession and chooses to change his mind and to change his approach to the situation. So this shows us that God is a God who responds, that he really does hear our prayers, that he does hear our cries for mercy for people, for ourselves. God listens, he hears, and he responds and as I said, I, I, really, I previously really struggled with this passage, this whole idea of God changing his mind, like, like he was confused or didn't really know what he was doing and that he wasn't in control. Why would he ever need to change his mind if he knows everything that's going to happen and he's all-powerful and all-knowing? Why would he ever need to change his mind? That kind of, this doesn't match up with the God that I read about. And there's an amazing book by a guy called John Mark Comer called God Has a Name. And he actually talks about Exodus chapter 34. So it will be the next bit. Um, But he does also talk about this and he talks about this situation and he says it really well. He says, the reality is, is that God would be less of a God 
if he couldn't change his intentions when he wanted to. That God, in his power, in his wisdom, surely should have the ability to change his intentions as and when he um, hears his people and as and when he wants to, because he's in control. And so he can do that, and that doesn't make him confused or not God, but actually it makes him all-powerful. And so a question that I have for you is we see Moses interceding on behalf of the people who did a terrible thing to the point that God wanted to destroy them. Do you ever intercede for others like that? Do you ever stand in the gap and say, God, have mercy on these people? Or do you say, you know what, God, you should destroy them. They have done loads of things wrong. Just get rid of them. It would be so much easier. And sometimes it probably would just to get rid of people that we think they're not doing things the way we want to do them. But that's not how God works. That in the midst of sin, God is graceful and he is merciful. That he shows mercy. But he calls us to stand in the gap and to intercede for others. And do you ever do that? Do you ever intercede on behalf of others? Do you ever feel the call to intercede on behalf of others? Do you ever feel you care enough for other people to stand and say, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that God's mercy would fall on you. I'm going to pray that God's goodness would be made manifest in your life, that you would know him more, that you would experience his healing, that you would um, receive the good news of Christ, whatever it might be, are you able to stand in the gap even when you know they've done something wrong? Because it's easy to do it when someone is, you know, has nothing against them, never done anything wrong, never hurt you personally. But even when they've upset you or upset someone you love, are we able to stand in the gap and pray, God, have mercy? And I find myself saying over this nation over England, God have mercy on us. We have made some terrible decisions and we mess things up here, there and everywhere. But God, would you have mercy on us? Would you restore this land? Would you bring revival in this land even though we have been unfaithful to the covenant before you? Even though we have not kept our end of the bargain and made you our one and only God, even though we have made idols of a host of other things, God, would you have mercy on us? Would you pour out your glory on us? And would you restore your presence to us? Because that's what we see happen in the rest of this story, that God restores his presence, that Moses says, show me your glory. And God reveals himself to Moses. And that's our prayer. God, would you, in the midst of my sin and in the midst of our sin, would you have mercy and restore to us your presence? And we see that this is a stark contrast between Moses and Aaron. Moses, who's standing in the gap, and Aaron, who, when Moses confronts him, says, oh, it wasn't me. They made me do it. Uh, no, it was them. They told me to do this. They told me to do that. Flashback, <laughs> Adam and Eve in the garden, when Adam said, oh, no, it was her. You know, it's part of humanity to want to blame other people, to shift the blame. We do not like taking responsibility. But we both need to intercede on behalf of others and take responsibility for our own failings, our own mistakes, the things that we've done wrong, and repent, and recognise our role and our place in it. Why? Because there's mercy, there's grace. But only when we come to a place that we can say, God, I repent and I recognise my wrongdoing. Sometimes we have to get rid of our pride. Pride can be one of the most painful things to let go of. But oftentimes, it's pride that we're holding on to that says that we don't want to repent. And we see in this story that some of the Israelites repented and came back when God said, do you want to? Will you acknowledge me as God? Will you repent? Some of them did. And those that didn't, they, they were basically destroyed. And we can feel destroyed when we don't repent. We can feel like... Everything's being lost, everything's going. Because God calls us to humility. 
And it's for the gift that is the most worthwhile gift, which is his grace and his mercy. So I guess my question is, where do you want to be? Do you want to be on the side of the people that say, yes, I recognise I've done something wrong, and God, please would you have mercy? Bring me back into your presence. Bring me back. Because our sin only keeps us from him. He's not gone anywhere. He's not doing anything different. But sin is its own reward. And we find ourselves creeping further and further back. But God wants to bring us back into his presence. And all it takes is simple repentance of recognising. I screwed up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for where I didn't put you first. But God, I want to. Help me. Help me to do that. So what we see at the end of this story, as I just bring this to a close, is that God sends the people off to the promised land. And Moses, he says that famous line, that, uh, that quote you might all know, he says, if your presence doesn't go with us, then don't send us. Moses knew that there was no point going forward in his life, in anyone's life, on the mission, on the journey, on anything, without the presence of God. Basically said, God, if you're not there, don't even bother. There's no point to me being alive if you're not with me. So Moses then says, God, show me your glory. Reveal yourself to me. And we might have expected a big flash of light, and I'm sure all of that kind of thing happened, and it was amazing, but what actually happened is it says, when he says, God, show me your glory, God told him his name. And he said, my name is Yahweh. And in chapter 34, he goes on to explain what that means, that he's gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and so on and so on. You can go and read it for yourselves. But when Moses says, show me your glory, God reveals himself by revealing his name. And we know that in the Bible, names are so significant about someone's nature and their character and who they are. So Joshua and Moses, they understood the value of God's presence above all else. And our culture wants to squeeze out the presence of God so that the physical world, that the, everything else becomes greater to us. But actually, we need to recognise that the presence of God, that the spiritual realm is greater than the physical realm, and that his presence really is everything that we need. It should be the place that we run to, not run from, even when we're waiting, even when we're confused and we don't understand what's going on. We have to recognise that Jesus is on the throne, that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, that he meets you in your sin, in all of your junk, and he has mercy for you to bring you back into his loving arms, and that you can encounter his glory, that you can say, God, I'm, I won't do anything without your presence. Come with me, be with me. So why don't we pray? Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are with us everywhere that we go, that you are indwelling within us. And Lord, I pray that you would reveal to us even more of your presence, that you would show us your glory, that you would reveal who you are, your nature and your character to us. Lord, I pray if there are areas in our lives where we have made idols of anything else but you, that you would reveal those to us, that you would humble us so that we could um, lose our pride and we can repent of where we have done those things. Lord, I pray that you would help us to take responsibility for those things where we've done something wrong. And Lord, for others, I pray that you help us to intercede and to stand in the gap Lord, we want your mercy. We want to be restored to your presence, God. And I thank you that as a Christian, we don't go anywhere without you. But we want the full reality of who you are. So God, I pray that you would show us that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So bless you guys. Have a good week. And we will see you again soon.